Thank you. Hello everyone. Uh, as you know, my name is uh, Philip Edu. I'm one of the, of the methodology experts. So I'm here with uh, Miss Jenny O'Keefe. Um, she is the social science ethics expert uh, for NCADE and she will be helping with me with the questions and um, so you just have to type in your questions and she will help me um, read in the question for me to address them for you. So um, as you can see here we're going to really have a discussion concerning conducting qualitative analysis and this is more of an overview because uh, for the past two or three years I've been talking about how to conduct um, qualitative um, analysis so what we're going to talk about is I'm going to show you the resources I have and things to think about as you collect your data and uh, as you are thinking about how you're going to analyze your data but there, there's a very important thing that you have to note um, this is you know whatever kind of strategy that you want to use to analyze your data they all start from having your raw data right you have your raw data that you call it from participant uh, maybe um, also may call it from um, it's uh, maybe a document that you call it from an organization or participant and you want to analyze that and then based on your research question you look for relevant information right and then when you identify those relevant information what do you do next you assign labels to those relevant information that is all about coding right you assign codes to them and then after that you just want to find out whether there's a relationship between the codes and based on that you group them we call it sorting you sort them and then come up with categories and then based on the categories you also develop themes right so you start from having a raw data empirical data practical information that you call it from participant and then you end up having themes sometimes you may start with the themes maybe based on what has been done in the literature you identify specific themes and then you go back to the um to your data uh, and trying to see whether there's um, some information there that are, can be linked to those themes right so sometimes it happens but most of the time you always start to have to start with the raw data and then end up having your themes that will help you to address your research question that you have. So for this presentation, I'm just going to give a brief information about what qualitative analysis is all about. And I'm going to also talk about the two main strategies in analyzing your data. And I'm going to also discuss tools that are available that you could use to analyze your data and i will briefly talk about manual coding and software aided coding um, so the first thing that i want to talk about is um, qualitative analysis what is qualitative analysis so as you can see from this diagram um, qualitative analysis is art right it's an art right and um, and this kind of art encourages um, creativity right you have to be creative this means that you have to think outside the box you have to allow yourself to think about potential explanation or meanings or underlying meanings of the information that you call it from participants right so there's a lot of flexibility here you always have to be creative Creative, creativity doesn't mean that you shouldn't abide, abide by the rules of analyzing qualitative data. It's a way of thinking about multiple possibilities, right? And see which one fit the data that you have. So you have to be creative, you have to think outside the box, right? And at the same time, you have, it's, 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 it also encourages, encourages uh, subjectivity, right? It's a subjective process because you, as a researcher, you are interpreting the data based on your understanding. And sometimes your background or biases might influence the way you interpret the data, right? So um, this means that 
participant has presented uh, participant have represented you with multiple explanation or multiple realities or multiple perspective or multiple truth and as a researcher you want to also see is there any kind of um, truth that runs across or is there any theme or thick group of themes that run across the information that they have presented to you you are subjectively interpreting the information participant has presented to you some people might see this process as a limitation but you can also see it as a way of a strength in that you are trying to allow yourself to um, think about many possibility in terms of the data that you have in understanding it and trying to find out which one best fits the data that you have right and in order to address the problem of subjectivity you have to be transparent when you are you have the data you are continuously interacting with the raw data right and it's done privately you and the data right people might not be aware of what you are doing in private concerning how you're analyzing your data so without being transparent nobody will believe your findings so you have to be able to tell your audience these are the actions that I took in analyzing my data and these are the decisions that I took that helped me to reach my findings so although it's a subjective process it's a personal process it's a private process you have to bring everything out so that people will believe what you found so this is this moves us to credibility right when you are transparent people will believe that information and also it will help future researchers to repeat the steps that you took in order uh, for you to uh, for you to reach your findings right so they are these are the th four main elements in conducting qualitative um, analysis right you have to be creative there's a some sort of subjectivity in here and you have to be transparent in the process and lastly there should be some credibility how do you make sure that everything is credible you have to show how you arrive at your findings step by step you tell them the action that you took in a process and then the outcome of each of the actions so this is what qualitative analysis is all about any question I think if not I can go ahead so so what are strategies that you could use to analyze your data so i have grouped them into two main strategies so research based strategy and also generic based strategy um so for the research base so this means that the strategy that, that you are using is consistent with the research approach right let's say you are doing humanistic um uh, phenomenological approach you are using a film uh, humanitative phenomenological approach right so this means that you have to follow the steps of humanitative phenomenological analysis right the step-by-step -step process and then when you click on this link where um, you can get access to my presentation on um, how to use this uh, approach right uh, some sometimes some students also use interpretive a phenomenological approach or analysis as a research approach so this means that you have to follow how the step-by-step -step process concerning how data should be analyzed under this approach and then lastly you we also have a transcendental phenomenological analysis where especially when you're using transcendental phenomenological approach you have to use that analysis right so there's always going to be there should be a consistency between the research approach that you are using and then the analysis that you're going to use right and so in terms uh, you know I, I can give you the brief difference uh, between them for humanistic you know it's all about interpreting test right let's say there's an information a document that you have collected right 
document wasn't directly written for your study, right? It was written long ago. So you want to analyze the document. You can use humanistic uh, phenomenological analysis where you look at who wrote the document, right? What was the intent? What was the situation at that time? What is what's the content of that information, relevant information that you have identified? Based on that, you'll be able to identify themes and then you can report those themes, right? Somebody is asking, what about case study? Okay, so yes, so uh, if you are using case study, um, there is a specific way that you have to analyze your data. But for the case study, you can also use generic way, and I'm going to talk about the generic way because case study is more of collecting multiple data to help you understand a specific case, right? Maybe no more than about the case or describe the case, right? So you might interview participant, you can collect document, can do observations. All these kind of data, you can maybe use generic way of analyzing the data. We don't have to follow a specific step um, consistent with case study. Um, case study. But there are researchers who have uh, proposed specific steps that you have to follow in analyzing your case study document, right? So you can you know read a little bit about it and see. Um, which way. But the most important is to make sure that the approach that you are choosing to analyze your data is consistent with the research approach or the method that you're using, right? Um, so transcendental, most of the time you think about this way, you want to describe participant experience or explain participant experience. But before you describe and explain participant experience, you have to bracket all your biases, right? And then how we, you know, we can look at it as meditation, right? Before you analyze your data or before even you collect your data, you have to think about what are your biases? What are your beliefs? What are your background? How can all this information affect how you interpret your data or talk to participants? Identifying all these biases, then you'll be able to bracket them, put them aside as you carry on with your data collection and analysis, right? We call it APOCHE, E-P-O-C-H-E, right, APOCHE. And then when you click on this link, I think that will also give you more information about how to use this approach. So it all depends on the approach that you want to and the method, and then that will help you to choose which one corresponds to that. And also we have, when you're using narrative approach, Saldana talks about narrative coding, where you look at the character, you know, you are coding characteristics and the structure of participant stories and then analyze it and then um, analyze them and then retell those stories, right? And when you're using granite theory, you have to also use these um, uh, coding methods, open coding, focus coding, Azure coding, selective coding, right? So there are specific approaches that you, you are, it's highly recommended that you use a specific data analysis strategy. And some of these are some of the examples, right? So let's move on to the generic one. So in terms of the generic one, um, this means that irrespective of the approach that you are using, you can use this whole way of analyzing your data. So there are four main steps that you have to follow. You have to code. Coding, as you know, is that you have specific, you have collected specific information from participants and you want to move, transform the information into abstract concept or abstract information, right? And you have to first identify relevant information from participant responses to your questions, right? And then you assign labels to them, that we call it coding. You assign codes to them. And then you go to a next stage where you sort them, right? You group them based on similarities, based on the underlying meanings, and then you move to the next stage where you try to generate themes and categories, right? Uh, themes from the categories that you have um, 
um, you have created right and the last step which is more of those who are doing granite theory you have to you know develop an experiment explanation or a model to explain the phenomenon that you are um, studying right so most of the uh, analysis will end in the third stage where you develop themes and then um, talk about the themes and see uh, talk about how they are addressing your research questions so this is a generic way of doing it um, so you have two options you can choose the um the one that are consistent with the approach or you choose the generic way but the most important thing is to make sure that you have good reason right you don't have to just choose it because um it's the easier way but do you think that you'll be able to collect or um, get rich information using this approach to address your research question right that's the most important thing and um, I have presentations on all these. Um, these are the links there to help. So these are the examples of generic one. So this must, depending on the book or the article that you read, some researchers give step-by-step -step approach on how to analyze your data. And I have grouped them into main, three main types. The first one is, you know, where the steps are focusing on searching for relevant information, right? So the focus is searching for relevant information. When you get your data, you read through the data and identify based on your research question, right? You identify information that are important to address your research question. After identifying them, you assign labels, which is code, right? A uh, concept to, um, to the selected information. And then you try to document uh, the importance of the code, right? Based on documentation of the importance of the code, you'll be able to move from the code to categories and themes, right? Because you are describing the code. You are giving, we call it empirical properties. You are giving an empirical property. It's just like operationalizing concepts, right? So when you code information, let's say you code participant response as anxiety, right? then you have to define what you mean by anxiety based on the information that the anxiety is representing, right? So that's how we, you know, you document the importance and also try to describe the property of the code. And based on that, you'll be able to move on to developing categories and themes, right? The next one is the one that you can also use is, um, allowing the uh, research question to drive the analysis in terms of identifying code coding methods so saudana um um in his book talks talk about um about 35 coding methods that you could use so you can choose about three or four coding methods and then based on your research question, and then you can use those coding methods to assign, develop code and assign the code to the uh, relevant information. So um, if you want more information, you can read this book and that will help you. And the last one that is not um, used frequently is where, you know, you developing a focus prompt. So let's say this one is normally used when um, you let's say you are talking to experts um, and then you want suggestion from experts concerning a, an issue right um, um, or you are talking to professionals concerning um, how they can address specific issue then because based on your research question then you can develop focus prompt and that focus prompt will help you to identify significant information from the data that you have and then use it to develop uh, categories and maybe code categories and themes to address your research question right so the focus prompt let me give an example let's say you your research is to find out from mental health professionals how to overcome stigma right so you want to talk to them you want to know their opinion opinions on how to the society can overcome mental health stigma so your research question is from the perspective of mental health professionals what are the um, ways what are ways of overcoming mental health stigma right 
So your focus prompt will be developed based on your research question, right? One of the ways of, this is a focus prompt, one of the ways of overcoming uh, mental health stigma is, and then you continue with that a phrase, right? Is, and then you look through the participant responses and then you can um, continue the sentence or end the sentence with that kind of information that you call, uh, you have already collected from them. So it's like, it's, um, it's a statement, the focus prompt is a statement that is trying to coach you to identify specific relevant information that will help you to address your research question, right? So um, any question I, I want to hear from you? Any question that you want me to address? Dr. Yeah. Adu, I, I had a kind of a specific question regarding the, um, how, how, the phrasing, uh, you know, how we would phrase the, because there's a lot of pieces here, right? If, if I'm using a, a, uh, a grounded theory, uh, uh, um, so my grounded theory would be the approach to uh, a data analysis, but the actual, uh, like the, I'm going to use qualitative content analysis uh, as the uh, research method. Is that an accurate way to say that or phrase that? Is, yeah, um, is you know you have to really defend the connection between the granite theory and content analysis, because mm -hmm. uh, content analysis focuses on first identifying specific uh, themes in the literature, or maybe based on your experience and based on the, those we call it code frame or coding frame, and based on these themes you go back to the uh, participant responses and trying to see whether you can use it to code the information that you have identified in participant uh, responses, right? And granite theory, most the, the, the core element of granite theory is to develop a process or develop an explanation to understand a process, right? Or to understand a phenomenon, right? So um, try as much as possible to really justify the connection. Now I cannot see the connection because the end product might be very different, right? The granite theory you, you is mostly used to um, analyze participant experience, not only experience, but participant behavior, thought process or a phenomenon to come up with an explanation or a model to understand or explain the phenomenon that you are studying, right? So if the, um, the content analysis, your role is to arrive at developing a model to explain the process, then you can do that kind of connection. But now I don't see using both um, in the study. Um, this is where they, there's an issue with the consistency. Unless you can really, you have a strong um, argument to, to connect the two, right? What, what, what is the similarities, right? That's the question people are so going if to you ask. Were, if you started with a grounded theory and you realize that uh, thematically, because I think if, I, if I'm hearing you correctly, the goal is to really come up with the themes or identify the themes and code those uh, so that you can tell the story through those uh, those thematic analysis mm -hmm. in grounded theory. Mm -hmm. But if you're if you're let's say you got for the through the first couple steps in uh, coding of you know open and focused and axial coding, and you realized oh this is you know applicable to another theoretical framework. Mm -hmm. And is it uh, what I haven't found in the literature is like is it as other what's the uh, I guess rules around switching at that point and moving over to, let's say, a con content analysis and actual doing uh, selective coding based on that framework. Yeah, I think that, you know, you see how um, you are connecting 
um it's nicely there because you started with granite theory you did a focus coding azure coding and then you develop some kind of a model or themes and the relationship and then you look at the themes as um you move into uh, cons uh, uh content analysis starting with the code frame right the code frame is the outcome that you have come you, you 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 have developed based on the granite theory and then use that code frame to do further analysis you see that connection if you can really make that connection that would be great right so you know this this talks about this um uh, emphasize on the the sense of credit you have to be creative in analyzing the pro uh, in the qualitative analysis process but you have to make sure that there is a, the connection is very solid right how you move from one methodology or approach or analysis to another um, the, uh, another analysis so it all depends on how you're going to really connect it um and i think that um you sent me um um your um, document on this one so i'll review it and then maybe give you more uh, specific feedback concerning that okay any other question there was one question that came through on the chat um, and the question is, when would you use ethnography instead of a case study? So ethnography, just think about it this way. You want to study participants in their environment, right? As they are doing something in their environment, something taking place at the time that you are there, ethnography, they are doing something and you want to observe, you want to collect information, you want to interact as you are doing something in their natural environment. This is where you can use ethnography. Most of the time, it's, it takes a long time, right? So in dissertation, I will never recommend to a student to do ethnography because ethnography is a long journey. It can take about two, three years to really delve into understanding what human behavior is in a particular context, right? So um, you can use case study um, as if you can define what the case is in a particular time frame. You know, you, if you have a boundary concerning the case, you can use the case study. Uh, ethnography is, 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 is it's a very intensive process and it takes a long time. And you have to, if you are studying a participant in your natural environment, one example is that, let's say you want to know how students learn, right? So this means that you go to their classroom, that's a natural environment, and then sit down, maybe you can be part of the student and observe them and maybe participate as that that's the activity is going on you are observing you are documenting you are talking to some of them that is ethnography right yes thanks <clears throat> thanks dr du uh i was the one that asked the question thank you for whoever uh pointed that out uh the i'm i'm for my dissertation i'm doing a study on the way trauma manifests in Israel, uh, where they're in a constant state of trauma, essentially. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I've gotten some pushback, because I, I was going to do with ethnographic study. I've got, got some pushback saying it should be maybe a case study instead. Mm -hmm. um, but I've been planning on traveling to Israel, and I felt like this would be a good way to keep it an ethnographic uh, study. Do you, does it necessarily need to take several years for it to be an ethnographic study? It's, it's, it's a complex issue and it has some kind of um, many angles. And I think that you cannot just go there for a few months or weeks just to, uh, to gather information because ethnography most of the time, you as a researcher are very highly involved in the process. And I think that for dissertation, maybe making a case study, that would be great. Um, I think that it's easy to handle. You can co collect multiple uh, data um, to address your research question that you have. So I will not recommend ethnography. It involves a lot of 
things and time and um, it's it's not going to be you 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 will not be able to deal with the issue completely by spending few um, time there. Um, so I will recommend case study, but you know, we can meet one-on-one -on -one and discuss and look at your research questions and look at your approach and see um, where we could go, so. Sure, I appreciate that. Thanks okay. very much. You're welcome. Uh, we had another question come in over the chat as well. And the question is, could you clarify boundaries in case studies? Um, it's, it's, it's a one that is very challenging to clarify. I think you can clarify it based on time. So let's say um, um, there's an incident that happened in a particular frame of time. Um, let's say um, natural disaster happened in a particular country, and then you want to find out how participants deal with that natural disaster, right? Um, and it happened maybe last year, June. Um, so do you see how it's time bound, right? And so you only focus on participants who were there at that time or who indirectly were directly affected at that time. And so you see how you draw a boundary concerning that. Um, you can also draw a boundary based on the participant that you want to focus on, a specific um, age range, um, educational level. It, there are many ways, and um, even for the concept that you want to look into, um, are you going to look into a general concept or a specific one? So any kind of, it's sometimes very difficult to draw a boundary, but what you can see that um, most of the time, the boundary is based on the time, right? A specific time. Yeah. And I will, um, if you can email me, I will recommend a book for you that will help you to better understand the case study. Hello? Yes. Hello. Hi, this is George. Hello, George. How are you doing? I'm good. I, I finally just dialed the number instead of trying to get into the meeting. Oh, <laughs> OK. So I think we are in the middle of the presentation. So the good thing is that we are recording it. So I will send you a link. If you email me, I'll send you the link of the recording so that will help you to uh, get more information okay. about what we talk about. OK. OK. Right. So, any other question? Then I think uh, we, I can move on to the next one. So, um, there are a lot of tools that you could use to analyze your data. Uh, we can, you know, we can use um, tools related to manual coding and also electronic um, or software aided coding. So in terms of the manual coding, the tools you can use, pencil, paper, uh, note cards, um, um, hard copy of the transcript and just write in it and underline, circle, and you can put them in the note on the note cards, especially so you identify significant information and then you write the label to do it on a note card and then you can, you can you know, uh, connect those level to the significant information that you have on the document. And also, uh, you can use Word document to do that. And I'll talk a little bit about, or you can use a, a cell spreadsheet to do the analysis. In terms of the software, uh, we have in vivo, we have Atlas TI, we have, we have a lot of software that you could use. But the one that I've, I've been using and been using to teach students uh, is the in vivo. It doesn't mean that you should use in vivo if you feel if you feel comfortable using Atlas TI and it's going to help you to analyze your data and arrive at your themes to address your research question. You can use that. Um, so there are a lot of resources online. You want to go to YouTube and you type how to use in vivo, how to use Atlas TI, how to use Transana you can get some kind of um, information, background information. In terms of the usability, usability the manual coding, um, you don't have to, it's easy to use because you don't have to learn a lot to use it. Um, you can use Word document, everybody use Word document. So you can use that to do the analysis. 
Uh, but it, for the software, you have to first familiar, familiarize yourself with the software first before you can use it. So what I always recommend is that don't wait until you have your data before you learn about a software. Start learning about a software because if you wait, you're going to be frustrated. Qualitative analysis is, is an intensive process and you are learning as you are analyzing the data. So you don't want to learn two things like learning the soft, how to use the software and learning how to code. It's going to be frustrating for you. I've seen students being frustrated using trying to learn the two. So you first have to identify the software that you think will help you and start learning about it before even you collect your data. And then you'll be able to uh, analyze. And, you know, I've done a lot of presentation on in vivo. Um, when you go to YouTube and you, you search my name, you can get a lot of uh, presentation on that. Just get a basic understanding. That will be helpful. In terms of when to use, um, for the manual, if you have small data, then I recommend using manual. You don't have to spend money to buy software. So small data like um, you've done maybe two interviews or dealing with about three participants, or maybe you are dealing with uh, a survey, open-ended survey that is not a lot of responses or information, then you can consider doing, you know, uh, using manual coding. But if you have a large data, like you have 10, 20 participants and you have uh, three pages of each transcript, um, it's gonna be frustrating if you use a manual, right? So um, I will consider using the um, software like in vivo if you have a lot of data to, uh, to analyze. And a good thing about the software is that you can even analyze videos and audios and documents. So you can put everything in one place and do the analysis. So. There's a lot of misconception about using the software. Um, I think that, as I say, you know, uh, qualitative analysis and art. So this means that there's some sense of creative, 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 creative process that a software will not be able to give you, right? One example is that the software will not give you what node or code that you have to use. You have to read the statement and think about a label to give to that statement, right? So um, just, you know, think about this as you are analyzing, you know, th the software is there to help you to organize the codes and try to present it in a very systematic way, right? So basically it's the organization, right? It's, uh, it, it, it's, it's not time consuming compared to using manual where you have to count, where you have to manually count and gather them, look at the frequencies. It takes a long time. So this one will help you to reduce a little bit of time and then help you to focus on generating teams and the organization, um, the software will help you with the organization. So any question concerning the difference? And are you thinking about using manual coding? Okay. So the next one is conducting manual coding, right? So um, I have, you know, there's a video here, there's a PowerPoint here about how to um, analyze um, your data using the software. Um, I think Jenny has posted that uh, the link there. So, so it, these are the, just a step, and um, I'm not going to go into detail because I have the videos here in the PowerPoint to help you. This is just to just let you know that you can use Word document to analyze your data if your data is not a lot, right? So you always start with your research question. Your research question are drive the study. And then after, you know, analyzing your research question or knowing which research question you want to address, then you label the research question, right? We call it assigning anchor code, anchor code. Anchor code are codes that are used to label your research questions, right? 
So based on the research question, what label do you want to give to the research question? The essence of you using the anchor code is help you, helping you with the organization of the code. So when you code, you know where the, um, the anchor code you have to bring it under, right? So it just helps with the organization. And then after doing the initial coding, you have to arrange them in alphabetical order, and then you can tally them based on the frequency and group them based on the similarities. And then based on that, you'll be able to develop themes and then you can do some kind of basic visualization of the themes and the codes and um, and present your results, right? Um, so um, I, the presentation also talks about in detail how to do all these things. And then using the software, um, basically I use InVivo and I have a lot of presentation on InVivo on, on YouTube. Um, so you start by, you know, you clean your files, right? Making sure that everything is ready for you to analyze and then you import the files and analyze them. Analyze means that you are assigning codes or notes to your significant information. So you have, um, when you drop the information into in vivo, then you can create node. It can be also called code. They are containers. So you create containers and then you look it through your data that you have. And then based on a research question, you identify significant information and drop them into the containers, right? So that's all about um, the coding process and then you can organize cases and characteristics I talk about it during, uh, in the presentation and then you can visualize your findings and then export and then do your presentation and I have a presentation on all of these steps um, as I said this presentation is just to point out the resources available for you to do the analysis and the actions that you have to take um, so if you want to get access to my PowerPoint, uh, you can email me, I can send it to you um, and any other resources that you want. Any questions? Okay, so if there's no question, I don't want to waste your time. Uh, we can call it a day.